morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Brown University. My name is Richard Snyder. I am the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at Brown, where I'm also a professor of political science. And I'll be chairing our, our first panel. But before I introduce the, the panelists to you, I wanted to make some welcoming remarks I want to acknowledge some of the people and institutions that made this event possible. And I want to make some very brief remarks about the origins and the architecture of the event, of the conference. Um, first off, in terms of acknowledging supporters of the event, I want to acknowledge the, the sponsorship of the Marcelino Botin Foundation of Spain. Uh, Brown University has a joint program with the Botin Foundation on leadership, liberal arts, and public service. This program is now in its sixth year, and it's a training program that aims to create a vibrant network of young and talented Latin American leaders who are dedicated to public service. Every year, we have about 40 undergraduates from all across Latin America come to Brown for a week for this program. And I want to welcome especially some of the 200 plus alumni of the Botin program who are joining us via live streaming. Um, in particular, I want to acknowledge one of the alums from the first cohort, 2011, uh, Cassandra Vega of Puerto Rico, because she's hosting a side event to this conference um, in Puerto Rico through the organization that she works with, the Sila M. Calderon Foundation, which is a nonprofit based in Puerto Rico that focuses on poverty reduction through employment programs and entrepreneurship. So I want to welcome that group and all the other alums who are joining us and will be joining us for online viewing of the conference. I also want to thank the Watson Institute for International Studies for hosting this event, especially the director of the institute, Rick Locke, for his support. And then finally, I want to acknowledge the dedicated and professional staff of CLACS, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Um, special thanks to Kate Goldman, the manager of the center, and Seth Stulin, the outreach coordinator and Botin program liaison. Um, without their support, obviously, we wouldn't be here. This would not have happened. So thanks very much, Kate and Seth. And then last but not least, I want to acknowledge my two co-organizers of this conference, uh, Nora Lustig and Ricardo Lagos, I'll say a bit more about them in a minute, they both put a lot of energy into making this happen. Um, a lot of energy and also uh, generously shared their uh, enviable Rolodexes uh, to help us put together the, the cast of characters that are here. Let me say something quickly about the origins of this event. In many ways, this is a sequel. Um, a follow-up to an event that we held here at the Watson Institute eight years ago, in the fall of 2007, to be precise. Uh, the event was organized by my friend and colleague, Barbara Stallings, who at the time was the director of the Watson Institute, if I'm remembering correctly. And Ricardo Lagos participated. That was the first semester of his eight-year uh, appointment, it turned out, to be as a professor at large at Brown. Nora was there, and Nora Lustig was there. I remember John Stevens being there, and, and Evelyn Huber, who uh, would have been here, but unfortunately uh, had a, a family situation that prevented her from being here, um, and, and various others, and including Fernando Enrique Cardoso. He was also at that um, event. And I'm trying to remember the title of the event eight years ago. I think that's important. The title of the event was simply Inequality in Latin America. <coughs> No adjectives before inequality. In other words, not declining inequality or increasing inequality, just inequality in Latin America. And if there were an adjective, everyone would understand it would have been high inequality in Latin America. Um, so now, eight years later, we have, as a title for this event, declining inequality, but with a big question mark in the subtitle. Are the good times over? In other words, will the trend that wasn't quite visible eight years ago of declining inequality, will it continue? And that is the, the focal point for, for this conference. How long will the trend to decline, of declining inequality last? Will it last? 
And to explore this question, we've assembled an interdisciplinary group of scholars and also practitioners. In terms of scholars, we have political scientists, sociologists. I think there may even be a few economists in the room. <laughs> and in terms of practitioners of development, we have an interesting assortment of people with a wealth of experience in domestic policy making, and especially with career trajectories in international organizations and NGOs focusing on development. There's also uh, a third group besides scholars and practitioners that I wanted to acknowledge. The, uh, the fourth estate, um, and even the, I guess, the fifth estate, uh, with reference to the internet. We have an interesting group of members of both the traditional and also new media with us. We have correspondents from the New York Times, from CNN, from the New Yorker, um, and Reuters, as well as a couple of bloggers on Latin American political <laughs> economy who are based in Latin America. And they will be participating in a concluding panel tomorrow on what do we know about inequality in Latin America and how effectively do we communicate about it to the public. Okay, so that's my welcome and introduction. I want to turn now to introduce the members of our, of our first panel. I'm going to ask them to try to limit their remarks to 15, at most 20 minutes. We can run a little bit over because uh, the second panel um, is a little bit smaller than we had anticipated. Okay, first I want to uh, introduce, we have Ricardo Lagos on the panel. He is a professor at large, currently at Brown, and the former president of Chile. Of Chile. He's widely regarded as one of Latin America's most important political leaders. He has held has had a very distinguished career of public service both at the global level and in Chile, where he was a key leader of the opposition to the military dictatorship before serving as Minister of Education, as Minister of Public Works, and then being elected president, becoming the first socialist to hold the office since Salvador Allende was overthrown by the military in 1973. After the presidency, um, he's been very engaged with public service at the global level, serving as chairman of the Club of Madrid, which is an organization of former heads of state whose mission is to promote democracy around the world. He also served as United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Change. As I mentioned earlier, he was appointed professor at large here at Brown University in 2007, and this is his final semester, unfortunately for us, after... Uh, after eight years. We also have on the panel Rebecca Grinspan. She is the Secretary General of CEIB, the Secretaria General Ibero-Americana, a position she has held since April of 2014. She is concurrently the Associate, the associate Administrator of the United Nations <coughs> Development Program, the UNDP, and she previously served as director of the UNDP's Regional Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean. In her home country of Costa Rica, Rebecca Grinspan was vice president from 1994 to 1998. She also served as housing minister, as coordinating minister of the economy, as coordinating minister of social affairs, and vice minister of finance. Welcome. And I'm also pleased to welcome Nora Lustig, she is the Samuel Z. Stone Professor of Latin American Economics at Tulane University. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development, as well as at the Inter-American Dialogue. Nora is also a founding member and past president of the Latin American and Caribbean Economic Association, La CEA, and she co-directed the World Bank's World Development Report of 2000-2001 on the theme of attacking poverty. Nora Lustig currently directs the Commitment to Equity, or the CEQ, which is a project designed to study the impact of taxation and social spending on inequality and poverty in developing countries. So we have a very distinguished group of panelists, and uh, I'd like to start things off with Ricardo Lagos. Thank you, uh, Richard. 
Well, I would like to thank you, all of you, for coming to this uh, seminar. And as uh, was remembered by Dick uh, eight years ago, uh, we have a similar conference on inequality. But 2007 and from 2007 to 2015, how many things are happening, not only in Latin America, but in the world. And I remember that uh, that seminar ended up with uh, what they call there a presidential dialogue. And that means that Cardoso and I were supposed to comment what happened during the seminar. Nevertheless, uh, before that, we talked to each other about uh, how unusual is life and time. Because here we are, former presidents attending a seminar, <coughs> learning what was going on in the field, and because you are going to learn a little bit more, then they were going to pay you in the university, which is not bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I, I, I think that uh, was really a remarkable experience, given what was Latin America in 2007. was the beginning of a decade of uh, growth. Uh, China was emerging. And we discovered later that whenever, or it, uh, according to OECD, whenever China has a one-point growth, Latin America, or at least South American countries, has a 0.4 growth, which is not bad. They, were, they used to have a growth of 10% uh, to digit, and then 4% was guaranteed for us. After saying that, I would say things have changed so much, particularly because of the economic crisis. And then the big issue is that what is the economic crisis and what about inequality after the crisis? And the other point I could say is that it's true that in 2007 we were rather optimistic in a sense that we have been able to reduce poverty. And we feel confident that now Latin Americans were able with good public policies, with growth, and with good focalized policies, it was possible to make a reduction in poverty. But at the same time, we discovered that, yes, it was rather easy to reduce poverty. It was extremely difficult to deal with distribution of income. And that was the, the title of that seminar. It's true. The question is, reducing poverty, you don't increase or improve income distribution, and all of us in this room know that. The big issue is, what has been the effect on the crisis and to what extent the crisis means also the end of an era in the developed world. To what extent has taken place many other changes in the structure of our economies, and to what extent those changes have produced influence in distribution of income. And I would say that uh, there is no question that uh, with regard to distribution of income, there has been some small improvement during the last years because of growth, but apparently since growth is not being as used as it used to be, then probably inequality has not been reducing in the forces that were before. And the seminar, I could say, uh, is going to be around seven big issues, I would say. The first one, of course, it would be, to what extent are we going to keep the old tradition, making a distinction of uh, income coming from labor and income coming from capital return? I don't think that it's necessary to mention Mr. Piketty in this area, but the, the issues, you know, are so obvious, so old, but sometimes because they are so old, we never mention anymore. The useful distinction, what about labor and what about income coming from <coughs> and needless to say that uh, there has been some improve reducing inequality coming from labor, but normally that has been offset because the increasing return of income coming from capital. And this is something uh, extremely useful to keep in mind as a first big issue in, in order to address the questions of income distribution. And what are the specificities? in regard to this distinction in Latin American countries, where in many cases the return of capital is much higher than the return of capital in developed countries. Number two, 
I would say, how important is the issue of income distribution by economic activity? Yes, I know it was in the 1940s that Colin Clark uh, decided to make a distinction about the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary sectors in the economy, etc., etc. And of course, the tertiary sector was something to be dismissed because things like financial services, you know, was not a real economy. The economy was the, the, the primary sector, the agriculture, and mining, and some other industries, and the secondary was the manufacturing sector, and that's it. That was the real economy. And during those days, of course, even up to the 80s or the 70s in the last century, financial sector was no more than 9% among sectors of economic activity. And what happened since the last uh, 30 years? Well, that in today's uh, United States, the uh, financial sector is uh, 35%. More than that? In my own country, in Chile, it's about 30. My goodness, what happened? What happened that with a beast the different sectors of the economy, the financial sector had become so important. Until what extent the major engine of income redistribution against, and to have a bigger impact on the financial sector in the economy. In other words, the question of how is the share of the different sectors in the economy, I think that is something that normally it has been neglected. But when you see <coughs> what is the influence of the financial sector in income distribution, it's quite different. If you have a share of 9% of gross domestic product, or the share is 25 or 30. Now, and this, I think it's a, another issue that, especially with regard to Latin America, is very important, but normally is dismissed, is not considered. And this will take me to the third issue. And the third issue has to do with the 1%. Uh, I was amazed when in this country there was a movement of the 1%. Because if you think about how it's possible to have a civic society organized around the 1%, what that means, uh, all of us understand in this room what that means, the 1%. But to say the movement against the 1% represents a very so, a social kind of social movement that normally is rather unusual. Because it requires some kind of knowledge or sensitization. And now to talk about the 1%, maybe everybody understands what we are talking about. What is the share of the income of the top 1% in each of our countries? And therefore, to what extent? This is going to present a different perspective from the point of view of social movement. Because if there is a movement vis-a-vis anybody -vis worry about the 1%, well, that means that the other 99 probably are not very happy. <laughs> and what are the movements on that? And, and, and this, I think, is a particular curious way of thinking, the, the issue of the income distribution. I never thought that it was going to be, especially in this country, a movement about the to say I don't belong to the 1%. So I think that here, what is going to be the, the four points connected with the previous one, which is the concentration of wealth. Because all of the discussion is about income distribution. But if we are thinking in terms of return from capital, then the concentration of wealth is becoming more and more important. And this is a very old issue, I don't need to tell you. It's just a question of reading Aristotle from Greece, you know, and thinking about the, the government of the aristocracy that end up being the government of those that has wealth, and then oligarchy, and then it, they even used, you know, to ostracize, to send to exile to the very rich because, according to them, they could indict the democratic system. Why, in those days, there's the question of extreme concentration of wealth, may put in jeopardy the political system that they have. And 
sometimes I guess that this is a very crucial issue in, in terms of uh, how important is the relationship between the economic concentration and has Lasky has told us that to what extent is going to be acceptable a democratic system of government if the democratic system of government tries to deal with the issue of uh, wealth concentration. The fifth issue has to do with the question of Latin American countries. And with the exception of Brazil, I would say that most Latin American countries are far, far, far away from the OECD media tax pressure vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis the gross domestic product. In other words, if you take countries like Mexico, or like Chile, like uh, uh, Peru, like Colombia, etc., all of those countries have a tax pressure about 20%, about, excuse me, 20%. And therefore, if it is room to increase taxation, but at the same time being able to keep the rate of growth and investment, in Chile last year, we tried to introduce a tax reform. There has been many discussions on that. Uh, let us hope that the tax reform will increase uh, the share of uh, taxation in Chile. But I don't think that it's possible to have countries in Latin America, given the growth that they have. Most of them are working very rapidly to become a middle-income country. The emerging middle classes is the usual, now, major social aspect in, in, in our country. Still we have poverty, but when you have a, a poverty being reduced at general level from 40 to 25, or, or in Chile more than that, then the question is, what about the people that leave poverty behind and now have different demands? And those different demands will require necessarily some increases in fiscal income, etc., etc. You know that better than me. And then the question is, and this is, will be the sixth issue that is going to be touchy at the seminar. Whenever they ask you, but what do you think is the real answer for distribution of income and improve the distribution of income, the best answer is to say education. And you are so happy with the answer, you know. <laughs> the only problem is how you do it. <laughs> and what that means, et cetera, et cetera. But it's true that you improve income distribution when you improve the educational system. This is very obvious, and therefore, the, que the answer is, is very easy to implement it and to discuss what are the right answers vis-a-vis -vis education is probably today one of the most difficult tasks in the region. We have been successful trying to uh, increase coverage, and the history of education in Latin America in the 20th century is increasing coverage, but the history of the 21st is what about uh, PISA, what about the uh, different system to measure the quality of our educational system, and the big issue is how you're going to finance. And therefore, we go back to the question of fiscal income, and we go back to the question of taxes, etc., in, now in relation with education. And finally, we decided to have a, a, a panel of governance and the politics of inequality <coughs> that we hope there we are going to get all the answers. <coughs> but uh, in that final panel where we get all the answers, I would like to put the question of, if it is true that there is some change in paradigm, in the sense that we used to work assuming that there is a very close correlation between increasing per capita income and at the same time increasing social and economic indicators in a particular country. And therefore, to have the increases in per capita income was essential, in addition to public policies, of course, to improve the, the standards of living of our people. The question is, when you have uh, some books like the Spirit Level and others, when they say, yes, you are correct, there is this correlationship very close, increasing per capita income from five to 10,000, <coughs> up to a point, the 20 or 25 <coughs> measure, because after that is not income, uh, per capita income growth, what is going to improve the standard of living of our society, but the distribution of that income. And therefore, after the 20, 25,000, 
you have a much better social and economic indicators in New Zealand or in Japan vis-a-vis -vis United States or the UK. And the answer is the different income distribution between those two countries rather than the per capita income. And then, uh, this is my final comment, would be now, as Latin Americans, all of us know, we are in a not very privileged situation that we still are one of the most unequal countries. I know that <coughs> one nation might be well need to be important, to what extent the genie is enough, to what extent we have an income distribution quite different <coughs> by geographical territory in our own society. We are proud when we say, look, our infant mortality rate is very low, 8 per thousand. Yes, but please, Mr. President, would you tell me what is the difference between the lowest and the highest uh, uh, towns and city councils in the country? The lowest has two per, per thousand. The highest, 43. Well, you are proud to have eight. But what are you doing in order to reduce the gradient between two and 43? In other words, when you talk about distribution of income, what about geography? In short, if we are approaching the $20,000, $25,000, I think that we would like to be among those countries that has a better distribution of income, which is not the case today. And this is why it's so important. If we were able to decline inequality in the last year, how are we going to make a specific measure in order to, again, take the emphasis in order to improve a better income distribution if we're going to keep growing in our economy, as I think that we need to, in spite of the actual situation. And therefore, if that is the case, how are we going to have a better income distribution to have better standards of living in our country? I hope that this seminar will help to clarify some of these issues. And thank you again for coming. Final point, I would say that the major emphasis and the concrete step for this seminar is not what I can say, I can do, it was very little. It was a Nora and Rick, the one that really did the job. I only allowed them to use my name. <laughs> <laughs>
the, the expansion of trade, international trade, of strong demand, high prices of a lot of metals, not only a few, <laughs> but a wide range of them, oil and food have been very high and have been a very important factor for, for growth. The truth also is that economic, macroeconomic institutions have improved also before. We manage that much better, and we saw that during the financial crisis, where our financial system and, and a, a economic stability a, was able to successfully a, a, a confront the, the problems of 2008. Now, it's also true that when we look at the numbers, the real good years of growth were 2003, 2008. And then we recovered, it's true, 2009 was a bad year, 2010, most of the countries, all of the countries, really, of Latin America recovered growth. But growth has not been as high as it was in the first, in the first part of this period. Growth has been slower. And it's also true that it has been, you know, the average growth rate has been 4%, and we are very happy about it. But when we compare ourselves <laughs> with the Asian countries, 4% growth is considered quite mediocre <laughs> in other parts of the world. So the very high rates of growth of 6 7% for 10 years for the region has not been the case. So it's true that it has been very good years, but it's also true that we have never achieved like the very high uh, rates of growth that other uh, emerging uh, economies in other parts of the world have, have done. The, the second is the whole issue of uh, redistribution and uh, uh, what has happened to poverty and inequality, as President Lagos uh, have said. And uh, um, uh, the truth is also there that economic growth and, and employment opportunities together with very proactive po uh, public policies in the social sector have been a good combination during all these years. It has not only been economic growth, uh, although it's true that the expansion of employment, as uh, uh, a lot of the research of many of you here have shown, uh, uh, the expansion, the, the, the redistribution part that you can attach to better employment opportunities is like two thirds of the explanation. So this is an, a very important part because many times when we hear about Latin America, the emphasis is put on the conditional cash transfers and the transfers of income to low income groups. But what has happened in the labor market has been more important for redistribution than the, the, the conditional cash transfers. And uh, there has been an, an expansion of employment at the same time that people that had access to education came into the labor market. And so, you know, <laughs> there, there was, and minimum wages went up. And the combination of these factors have done a lot of the impact in better re, uh, redistribution of income in the region. The conditional cash transfers is, is an important point because uh, right now I think that we have around 130 billion people in Latin America under cash transfer scheme. Schemes is 24% of the population. So it's not a minor point. Yes, it's, we are not talking here uh, about very small pilot <laughs> models of, uh, of income transfer. These are big and very continuous uh, 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 policies and programs that have been put in place. But I think that to be able to answer the question of the seminar, are the good times over, we have to look at the labor market. And what is what we are expect, expecting to happen in the future in the primary distribution of income, not only on the redistribution of the state. And how these two will play together, I think that is a, a big part of the discussion that we have to have, uh, we have to have today. So uh, the result of all this, is really a different social structure in Latin America today than we had before. And, and this is also for the political stability, for what will be the demands 
for the future on our governments, uh, this is a very, a very uh, central point in the in the research and and, and uh, work done by by Lopez Cal by Notis. When we uh, we have like the the sector of the population that is under the poverty line, what they call the vulnerable groups and what they call the middle class. Yes, those. The, the percentage of the population under the poverty line, $4 per day, is around 25%. But for the first time, in average, weighted average on the, in the region, the poor are less than the middle class. That is 34% of the population. Those that are with, per cap, with the uh, incomes per day of more than $10 per day to $50. And the larger portion of the population is in the middle. They have gone out of poverty, and they are above the poverty line, but they are not middle classes. Not everybody that went out of poverty is middle class. Yeah? So they are around the poverty line. They are very vulnerable. And most of them don't have social protection scheme. At least half of them ha don't have any social protection schemes. And 70% of the poor don't have any social protection schemes still. So in that sense, the, <laughs> the, the, the work uh, is not done. <laughs> we have still you know, 37% of the population in very vulnerable conditions, <coughs> especially now when we have a very strong slowdown of the economy and less fiscal space than we had to face the 2008 financial crisis. So less economic space for countercyclical policies and stronger and, uh, 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 aspirations from the people that have gone through social mobility during these, these years. Uh, so when we look with, with, with this panorama, when we look uh, forward, in a way, we see a region that, for the first time, has been able to grow, also decreasing inequality around 0.9 percent per year during all these years. This is, you know, very strong. Uh, uh, this is a uh, very uh, positive. But still, we are the most unequal uh, region in the world. I would think, I would agree that. There are a lot of problems with the Gini coefficient. And sometimes we talk about this, avoiding to talk about the problems of the Gini coefficient. And I think you put it on the table present, and I think that is, is, is very important. In, in part because uh, uh, we are not talking about the distribution of wealth, <laughs> and we have much less indicators for that. And also, the inequality, the horizontal inequality, is a very important part of the dynamic of inequality in Latin America. And we have to talk much more about that. We have to talk about gender inequality in a, in a serious way, because it's a, a, an important part of what we can do for the future if we want to go into more equal society. Also, the issue of uh, territorial inequalities. You know, we have several countries within the same country. We have always. It talked about Mexico being five countries, that one, <laughs> a lot of it, territorial inequalities, and we have to talk more seriously also about it, and the indigenous and African <coughs> populations in the region. And we, we should not focus only on income inequality. We need to go farther and talk also about horizontal inequalities if we really want to be serious about that. And what you have said also, uh, President Lagos, that is, the inequalities in the access to services, not because of access, but because of quality. And uh, here, I want, you know, looking looking at the future, I want to uh, to to talk about my my own uh, dilemmas, <laughs> my own dilemmas for the future. On on the on uh, first, I think that the again again, <laughs> this is like a deja vu. But because we are in a slowing of the economy, and we are again in fiscal 
adjustments. And consolidation is how cats are being <laughs> named today, <laughs> fiscal consolidation. So I think that these false dilemmas are coming ag again into policy, policy debate. And uh, we have to be aware of them again. One is the dilemma between targeting and universal, universal systems. And that is coming again into the, into the discussion in terms of public policies. And uh, with such a different social structure today than we had before, you know, if we will <coughs> fall again into these false dilemmas, I think that we will have serious political problems in the region. I hope in the seminar we can, we can talk about it. The second is the dilemmas of what do we do when we have certain <coughs> consolidation? We fight poverty or we fight inequality? Again. And I am hearing again and again when I go around the countries, again, this false dichotomy that, you know, or you talk about inequality, but you are really talking about poverty. Huh? And we can lose, again, the debate if we fall into, you know, if we think we have to choose <laughs> between poverty and inequality in terms of, of uh, public policies. And the third is the whole issue of, uh, that is related, is related to this, is the, the, the whole dilemma between access and quality. I really believe if we don't tackle the problem of the quality of services, especially health and education, we won't be able to tackle the dynamics of inequality in the region. And we hear again that the most important is to finish the access, the, the, the access uh, challenge, and that quality will come afterwards. And the truth is that the intergenerational, the intergenerational transmission of inequality comes through inequality, inequality of education. You know, if the poor will continue to have access to poor education, and the better off will continue to have a, a access to good education, the, you know, in the labor market, we won't be able really to make a difference in the primary distribution. And so here my my last uh, my last point on on the productive structure that you also brought to. Uh, to the table. I think that we did well in the macro level, but uh, I don't think we did well at the micro level. <laughs> we did, you know, we did what we had to do, you know, to improve our macro management of the economy, but the micro economics were not part of public policy, not, not sectorial, not, you know, very little. Maybe there are some exceptions, maybe in agriculture, in, in Argentina and Brazil, but most of it, we continue to have small and medium-sized enterprises that have, do not invest, have no innovation, they, are, they provide most of the, of the employment, they are not linked to the external economy, to more competitive economy, there, there is no real change in knowledge and science and technology. Uh, it's, it's very sad to see that in the 90s, uh, the number of patent registration from Latin America and Asia was more or less the same. <laughs> when you look at the numbers today, you, you ask yourself, you know, what, what, why we haven't done much better? You know, uh, Asia is uh, registering three, four times more than Latin America today. And we were in the same point only 20 years ago, yeah? So there is something we haven't done. We haven't used the good times to really change or think about our productive structure. There has been a reprimarization of, of, a, of, a, of growth, in, especially in, in South America, especially in South America. But uh, it's not, it's not uh, if we will, I think, it's not if we will produce primary goods or manufacturing goods or services. We need to produce all of them, <laughs> but with much more knowledge, much more technology, much more innovation in all we do. I think that the dichotomy between producing manufacturing or services or only manufacturing being the one providing 
opportunities for innovation is, 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 is not true. You know, the new uh, research show us that in services, you have a lot of innovation, especially with the new technologies, and that really you can have a lot of uh, a productivity growth do, doing well in, 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 in primary goods, in manufacturing goods, and in uh, services if you really go for the value added, for talent, for science and technology, and, and, and for knowledge. And uh, with respect to the tax structure and, and what politics will, uh, will we have uh, to be able to change that, I, I, I want to, to put a, a caution there. Because uh, we have improved tax, the tax uh, 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 progressivity and, and, and also the tax pressure uh, in the region. A, a lot of the, of the increase in, in uh, social sectors uh, with uh, public investment, the five points increase, a lot comes also from better tax systems. <coughs> and there are many countries that, are, that have done tax reforms lately. Chile, Colombia, even Mexico <laughs> uh, have done that. But the problem is that I don't see the possibility of going farther if what you want is the middle classes to pay the taxes for the poor to receive the services that they are not receiving <laughs> and for the rich not paying. You know, at the end, it also comes to not thinking that you will just improve the tax system charging the middle class without the middle class receiving the services. You know, the targeting, the extreme targeting, with easy solutions for tax, tax collection is not a good social contract <laughs> for political stability and, you know, moving forward uh, in, in this, in this uh, very, very important, very important area. So I think that we have to talk also about what is the political contract <laughs> that will make it possible for us to really go for better, more progressive tax systems like Nora eh, very well will tackle, and also what is the political possibilities of the middle classes going for it in a moment where they are very dissatisfied in their aspirations, with the quality of services, with the accountability of the political system, and with the political system itself. So, here we have like a, a, a very, very, we have to think a, very a, deeply in terms of how do we recover politics as an important thing to be able to have a new agenda for what is coming. What we did before was good, we did well, but it won't help us in what is coming next. So we need to recover politics as important and we need to recover the politics of the new social structure to be able to put forward new solutions uh, for the challenges that still lie ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca Nora Lustig. start also by, by thanking very deeply Brown University, the Watson Institute, the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies, and in particular Richard Snyder for allowing me to be a partner in this and uh, for Ricardo Lagos to invite me to join in this endeavor, which I think is going to be quite interesting. The idea, I mean, we, we actually... <laughs> We actually came up with the idea with Ricardo after he was exiting from a meeting with Michael Schichter in a dialogue in Washington, D.C., and he started, oh, yeah, let's, you know, why don't we do something? So let's help. Let me stop you. You run into someone, and you decide to go for it. Uh, so what I'm going to share with you today is actually a composite of uh, what's been uh, a research agenda that involves a lot of people and institutions. I strongly believe, contrary to what the academic world does, which encourages individual 
and individualistic research, but actually working in networks of researchers is the best way to move forward. And I hope that uh, rewards change in the academic system at some point to recognize that, as they do in the hard sciences and the biological sciences. I hope this comes to the social sciences. Which work is here? Well, actually, in part of the work is with Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, who unfortunately couldn't come here when we started in 2007, and the Rebecca, when she was the director of UNDP's uh, Latin American Bureau, we started working on a project that wanted to understand why inequality in Latin America was so persistent. And lo and behold, we discovered that actually it was not so persistent because as, as we started looking at the data, we saw it was declining. And uh, so I said, well, we have to change then <laughs> the course of our research. And that's what made us a little bit like the pioneers of the discovery that Latin America has been experiencing a decline in inequality. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some data that is quite striking when you compare it to the rest of the world. Then this research agenda continued. We had some things with UNDP when George joined. And then uh, now there's a big project. I always try to sort of partner with, uh, with the multilateral institutions that have resources and networks with uh, the Chief Economist Office, Augusto de la Torre, who didn't come here, but Daniel Leverman, Joana Silva, Julian Messina, who moved to the IDB, so now it's also the IDB part of it. Chico and Luis Felipe Lopez Calva were pursuing the same question, looking deeper and deeper what may be the underlying factors that explain this phenomenon, which is very new in the region and very unique to the region, as I'll show you in a moment. In addition, there's another project, and I'm not going to be able to go in depth into that, Rebecca, because time is short. The taxation, and, and you're busy. I'm going to show you a little snippets of this commitment to equity project, which we started in 2008 or 2007, also at the Inter-American Dialogue, and now CGP and Tulane University are all partners of this. And so I'm going to show you some results. This project is not just for Latin America. We're looking at uh, about 34 countries globally, including all the BRICS. So we, I'm going to show you a little bit of comparative uh, data on middle-income countries for South Africa, Indonesia, and some Latin America. OK, so let me start with the, with the facts. Uh, the fact is, we all know Latin America has a very high inequality, but definitely it's been declining since around 2000. The decline is pretty pervasive and significant in both Gini points or whatever indicator you want to <laughs> use. And also significant statistically, it's larger than the rise in the previous period. So it's not just a reversal of the increasing inequality. I'm going to show you some data. It's the region with the most significant decline. I'm going to show you some data, which is new. Uh, it's actually part of our operating databases. Special issue that Chico, Ferreira, and I are working for the Journal of Economic Inequality. I'm going to show you a little bit of that. And uh, it's been an important contribution, the decline in inequality to the decline in poverty and the rise of the middle class. The interesting thing is that you know, when, once you start looking at it, uh, you, you discover that this decline happened in a variety of countries in terms of their profile. Countries with high growth, like Chile and Peru, countries with low growth, Brazil and Mexico. Mind you, Brazil grew at high rates only for a short period of time. If you take the average for the, for the period that, that we're looking at, it's above Mexico, but it's also below all the others. Interesting also in countries that were governed by, have been governed by leftist government and not left. So it's not just the rise of the left. In commodity exporters and commodity importers, and in countries with rising and stagnant minimum wages. So there's the usual suspects are not the ones that <laughs> seem to be the ones that allow us to say, OK, this is common to the region. So we're looking for a common phenomenon. And then we're going to be analyzing which additional forces are reinforcing this common phenomenon or countervailing. That's you know, they, that's what we're trying to do in the new phase of this project that I mentioned <coughs> earlier with the Chief Economist Office at the, at the World Bank. Okay, this is a, a graph that many of you have seen in many different guises that Latin America has excess inequality. The line that's uh, in red, the straight line in red, tells you what would be the regression of all these point, data points. 
And the black squares are the Latin American countries, as you can see, they're above. So Latin America, for the same income per capita, has higher degrees of inequality than other countries. We knew that. However, this is quite interesting. This is data we collected recently from uh, many different sources. But here, I'm showing you data that comes from the World Bank forecast for Latin America is the black, and for um, for the rich countries is the IDD OECD database. As you can see, the only the only region that has a significant decline on the average of inequality is Latin America squares. The other second one is South Asia, but it's a second one. It's only half as much as Latin America. The others. Some of them show maybe a little bit of an increase, a little bit of a decline. We don't know even if it's statistically significant because it's, it's small and we don't have a confident interval. But there's no doubt, you know, five points of a genie is a lot. So that's quite, uh, quite remarkable. I wanted to say something about, you know, people are criticizing the genie and they're coming up with other ways of measuring using the Palma ratio and other things that are being thrown out. Uh, in the in the open, by the way, the ratios have been around with us for a long time before before Palma put it. But I think that the reason why perceptions are not capturing this—that's what people say. A lot of people say, "Well, when you talk, when you talk to people in the street, nobody tells me. Yeah, yeah, I can see that inequality is falling. I see inequality rising, because all the measures, including the ratios, are relative measures. And what's been rising is the absolute difference. Even if you have a decline in relative measures the incomes of the rich are going to be many fold higher than the incomes of the poor. And that's what I think people are reacting to. And we should begin to add absolute measures of inequality. And I, you know, I, I say this to our project also, if we want to link what's happening in the inequality sphere with the political and social discontent as well. Otherwise, we, we can't see that. We can't see the connection. OK. Oh, by the way, this is you know, <laughs> the data we could collect on Sorry, I mean, but if you go and have a magnifying glass, you're going to be able to see which countries. <laughs> but what's important on this uh, graph, it shows, you know, for a bunch of countries, which ones have inequality going up, which here shows with green, although it's bad, and the ones that are falling, it's in red, which usually is bad, but here it's good. And you see that towards that end are the higher inequality ones. So most of Latin America is on that end, and you can see a lot of falling inequality. It's, again, the same thing that I showed you on average, but you can see it five times here. This is to show you that the decline, which is the green here, it's green, <laughs> and the increase is uh, red. The decline that happened in the 2000s is definitely higher than the increase in the past. So it's not just a reversal okay, of what happened in the past. Uh, and, you know, here I'm going to show you what uh, Rebecca mentioned a moment ago is how the uh, decline in, in, in inequality has contributed to the reduction in poverty, which has been remarkable. Here I'm going to show you a graph with $4 a day in terms of the power parity and a robust expansion of the middle class. So this is what happened to the poor. That's what happened to the middle class. And uh, the vulnerable is a group that more or less stayed the same. The vulnerable being defined here. We're using income thresholds. I'm sure that uh, Kiko is going to go more in depth in that into this. Why are we using these income thresholds that we chose to define uh, the various groups? It's an imperfect definition, and I know sociologists probably cringe, but that's the one that uh, we find that has been helpful for a number of reasons. So this is, you know, how much of this change in uh, poverty can be ascribed to the reduction in inequality versus growth. This is by countries. So remarkably, on average, which is the arrow, 61% of the uh, reduction in poverty is due to growth. You would expect that. It was, these were in general good years. But you know, 39% was as contributed by the reduction in inequality, which is not insignificant. It's a lot. Okay, so that, that's one thing. And for the uh, expansion of the middle class, 20% was due to the reduction in inequality. So inequality has played an important role in both of the dynamics that we see in terms of changes in social structure. 
So why did inequality decline? I would say this is our pivot. <laughs> but now, you know, I'm convinced that our first answer is still the one that we need to pursue. Uh, and uh, we'll see. I am willing to be proven wrong in our new phase of the project, but I, I still believe that, you know, I've gone around 180 or 360 degrees and came back to the uh, main result that we found in the book that we edited in Lopez Padua. So there are three important uh, things that happened in, 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 uh, in the context of Latin America that have been a major driver. So you look, I mean, these are, I'm gonna just show you a graph, a figure rather, that, what, oh, this is all the figure, I figure. <laughs> anyway, that block, <coughs> that shows that uh, what happened in the labor markets, like, Rebecca mentioned, and like uh, Ricardo mentioned, has been tremendously important. The reduction in labor income inequality is the main driver. Government transfers have played a very important role, but also private transfers, and I think that explains uh, what's happened in some countries that are very much relying on remittances. Okay? So, about 60% of the reduction in the Gini coefficient is explained by a reduction in labor and income inequality. And what has been the common factor throughout the region is the reduction in the relative wages of people with post-secondary education. We've come to the conclusion that the only force that has been homogeneous across all these different types of countries that have grown or not grown, money exporters, importers, leftist government, centrist government, is that all of them experience an expansion of education that changed significantly the composition of the workforce. And so here you see, this is the decline in annual Gini in the period 2000-2012, and the green and blue dots show the change in share of labor force, the green ones of workers with tertiary education, in percentage points, and the blue ones, the change in share of labor force with secondary education in percentage points. So people with skills, here skills equated to education, became relatively more abundant. It's a little bit of a boring story, because if we leave, okay, the market is working, we have more people with skills. <coughs> people with low, lower skills become relatively scarce, and the uh, wages begin to reflect that. But it's a force that has been operating throughout the centuries since capitalism is in place in many countries, and in fact, the increase in inequality in the US is due to a reverse <coughs> process. If you read Katz and Golding, we see that that's what the story is for the US. Here we have the change in returns to secondary schooling and tertiary or post-secondary, uh, and the change in the Gini, the red triangle are the uh, returns to tertiary education. You can see that the, there is an association of a decline in the returns and the decline in the Gini. So that's you know the bottom line. I think the bottom line of what happened in the region is that supply of skilled labor outpaced its stimulus. Then, there is a very important link to education. Even though we have a lot of problems in terms of quality, this has been an important part of the story, I think, for Latin America in the decade that we are, well, more than decades that we seem to, to, uh, to finish. This has been probably the policy that paid off. There was, after the debt crisis of the 80s, in which the access of education actually was reduced. We have to remember that also. You know, access was jeopardized during the 80s. There was a big expansion in the 90s, and that eventually has resulted in this. That will be accompanied by reinforcing factors and countervailing forces. And that's you know what I want to learn today <laughs> from everybody that's working on this. What reinforcing factors are? Well, labor market institutions like rising minimum wages have played a role in some countries, 
and we need to you know, Brazil, I'm sure we're going to hear from Marcelo later about this, and Julian probably and Chico are going to tell us a little bit. And I guess maybe associated with the rise of leftist parties, because in Mexico, for example, uh, centrist governments and the minimum wages have fallen in the early 90s and stayed like that until last year, in which they, I think, even changed bills. In. There is also, um, this is something that our current research is looking into, this it may be declining quality in the new generation of workers with tertiary. We discovered with uh, one of my students, and then with my co-author, Raimundo Campos, in Mexico, my student is Chinese and she's working in Brazil, that <laughs> wages of people with tertiary not only fell in relation to people with primary, but they also fell in absolute terms. So no wonder people are unhappy, because you know real wages are declining on average. So we started to say, okay, is it the new entrants that are you know, worse quality because schooling expansion was accompanied by deterioration in quality? There is some evidence that maybe that's what's happening in Brazil. But in Mexico, what we discovered is actually the older workers are the ones that have <coughs> lost a lot, and not the, the new entrants. So we're trying to understand, well, what's behind that? Is it that you know, there's skill obsolescence, the labor saving technical change? Uh, Maybe that's associated to lower growth. There's less demand for tertiary, or people with tertiary education, or growth in that demand. And maybe that's what's happening is that firms are replacing the more expensive uh, uh, older workers by younger workers who also have more complementary skills, <coughs> skills with a new technology. Something is happening there that's quite peculiar. Now, what are the countervailing forces? I don't know any. I'm just thinking that maybe one is assorted in matching because we know that now <coughs> educated men tend to marry educated women, which is not the case many years ago, and that is maybe a reinforcing process of an unequalizing process, right? But I don't know. I mean, there may be others, and again, this is what I think might be interesting to look into. We've also had, like uh, it's been emphasized, and I showed you in that little uh, uh, rectangle in, in, in the rectangle, the, the multicolor rectangle, that uh, more progressive transfers have been the role. And I think there's been two types of transfers that have been expanding in Latin America. One is the conditional cap transfers targeted to the poor. Some of them are not so targeted, like in Bolivia, and some are not so conditional, or the conditions are not enforced, but that's pretty much what's happened. But also one thing that happened very much in the region is an expansion of non-contributory old age pensions. And in some countries that has been the main force, for example, my own country, Argentina, that's been a major, a major instrument, which is also politically very rewarding because we have a lot of happy people, uh, especially women, that uh, before were not receiving any any pension, and now they have access to that, and I think they respond uh, positively in the voting period. I think that one of the reasons why we've had this switch is because the cash transfers are a genuine technological innovation in social policy. Because I remember that in the early 90s, if anybody would have told me that you could distribute <coughs> cash in the Sierra de Puebla, or maybe in the you know, jungles in the Mato Grosso, I say, you're crazy, how are you gonna do that? Well, it's possible. And not only it's possible, that technology has been improving by the day with the use of smart cards and so on. So it's quite an amazing innovation that has allowed this, has reduced corruption by a lot because it's much easier to be you know, so blurry when you have goods that are being subsidized than when you have cash. So cash, people know how much they're supposed to get. If they don't receive it, they can complain. So this has been an interesting thing, and uh, I, 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 I'm sure people are working on this, so we'll hear later. Politics, like Rebecca said, democratization and inclusion of previously excluded sector. And if you read Peter Lindbergh's history of uh, the welfare state, clearly democracy was one of the main driving forces that led to the increase in social spending. And I think that the rise of the left created the dynamic of electoral competition. And so center-right governments probably adopted part of the leftist uh, discourse and, and policies in order to be competitive in the electorate. Let me show you, you know, something that uh, 
this is part of this project on the, the Dominion Black Bee project. How does the middle income countries in Latin America compare in terms of fiscal redistribution with uh, other middle income countries and with the EU and the United States? What we have here is the change in inequality shown it's positive, but it is a reduction. The reduction in inequality, both when you think of social insurance pensions as deferred income, so they are part of market income, and when you include them as a transfer. I, I don't have time to go into this discussion, but if you want later, we can go into it. Well, you can see Indonesia is a relatively low inequality country. Gini is around 0.38, practically no redistribution. But Colombia and Peru do, do very little. Mexico does a little more. Brazil does quite a bit, especially if you consider pension as a transfer. The big, big redistributor in the middle income countries is South Africa. South Africa actually is a poster child of redistribution, if you look at it. But even with all the redistribution, it's still the most unequal country after. But it does a lot of things right. That's the average of the seven countries, USA and EU. And one thing that's very interesting to note is how different the story is depending on how you treat pensions, by the way. A lot of the redistribution in the EU and the US, but especially in the EU, happens through pensions. And pensions can be deferred income if people contributed to the system. So it is not correct to treat them exactly as a pure transfer. So the, the redistribution picture changes quite a bit. Now, when you look at poverty, the story is less auspicious. Here I added to the effect of direct taxes and transfers, the effect of indirect taxes, like VAT and other sales taxes, and indirect subsidies. There are two countries in which poverty is higher after the FISC than before the FISC. In the case of Brazil, if you do not think that pensions are a transfer, poverty increases in the post-fiscal. Consumption taxes, by the way, are not necessarily regressive, but they can be poverty increasing, which is different. And people tend to think that regressivity means the same thing as poverty. No. Okay? And Colombia is another one. And we have found this in, in several other countries. And I think that uh, this, I think, has to be borne in mind <coughs> at this point in which countries will have to search for new revenue sources. If they rely on indirect taxes, they may run into more of this problem of actually impoverishing the poor. All right. I told you, you know, what happened to income distribution and a little bit of income redistribution, just a snippet. I want to make a big caveat is all our data doesn't include the rich, it doesn't include the capital income. Let's crash it here. Let's see. Uh, we have the rich are missing. And unfortunately, one of the speakers on the rich, on the top incomes is missing too, because Facundo Alvarado couldn't come after all. But we have Sasha, who in the next panel is going to talk about a parody that hopes in the case of Chile, right? I did this back of the envelope calculation of, uh, OK, so taking Forbes and Mary Lynch list of rich people, what would be <coughs> their average income? This was before the crisis, when the average return was considered to be 5%. So, you know, if you take the 4,400 Merrill Lynch's individuals that have high net worth, they should be getting $600,000 a month, then Forbes 30 billionaires, 50 million a month, and then, you know, I like to make <coughs> it a joke, which is not a joke, actually, what would be Carlos Slim income if uh, he would pocket the, his return to, to assets? It would be $150 million a month. So, when you look at the surveys, the top incomes have way less than any of the rich. And this happens not necessarily because there is a distortion in the surveys. The surveys, the sample design sometimes would have to be done in such a way to capture the rich. It's almost impossible. You capture them by, by coincidence. But the problem is that the data that we need to measure what happens at the top is not readily available. That's what we need to pursue, transparency, so that we want to know what's going on with capital income, what's the return, how much they're paying taxes. 
four rich countries, or the advanced countries, you have a wealth of data on this. And uh, the US has been publishing this data since, since 1913. So it's time for Latin America to do that. But I think you know we're going to learn a little bit of what we know about the trends in top incomes and how much top incomes are taxed. It'd be nice to see whether percentage-wise the trend that we found with the Gini coefficient for household surveys is it validated when we see what happens at the top as their share declines. We know that the absolute differences are growing. It's when, the, when an economy is growing, the absolute differences will grow. All right, so finally, I want to talk a little bit of what to expect in the more challenging times because I think that some of the people will show us today that there are some indications of maybe inequality, the decline in inequality has reached a little bit of a plateau. And is this a trend or is it a blip? We don't know yet because the period is short, but what, what can we expect? And I think that with lower growth and fiscal consolidation, as it's called now, <laughs> Lower, there'll be lower labor demand, so market-determined wages at the bottom will grow less, not at all, or decline. I think that it's also there is a cap to increases in real minimum wages, given the, uh, the fact that also that uh, <coughs> affects what the governments pay, and with lower growth also there's going to be more resistance from the private sector to accept that. But the wages of the skilled workers are maybe going to fall, continue to fall, because maybe the demand for them also is lower than their supply. So the net effect will depend on which factor dominates. And I think we don't know yet because we don't have a capacity to predict what would be, and that would be very nice if eventually we can, out of all this research, to have an ability to have a labor market model that will allow us to see what happens during slow growth or high growth in terms of the net effect. Private transfers are more optimistic because with the U.S. recovery, uh, I think that uh, remittances are going. So that's the only bright spot currently that I see in the, in the horizon. And government transfers, I think that uh, I think we're stuck in a problem. We're stuck in a problem because facing this fiscal retrenchment or you know, limited fiscal space, we're going to transfer, even targeted transfers, Cannot grow, even the transfer or universal. <coughs> so may, you know, some countries may even have to cut them. I think in others they will get eroded by inflation, like in the case of Argentina and Venezuela is happening already. Uh, and in addition, there may be taxes that will have to rise with this process of fiscal consolidation, and so this will affect groups quite deeply, especially those that hover around poverty. And I want to finish with a graph that shows you who are the net payers into the fisc uh, for these seven middle income countries by income group. So the lowest income group uses the $1.25 poverty line, which is this ultra poverty line for us, for middle income countries. The next one is between $1.25 and $2.50, which is extreme, extremely poor. The next one is from 250 to 4. This is all dollars a day in purchasing power parity, which uh, are the moderate poor. The group from 4 to 10 are what we call the vulnerable or strugglers in the paper that we wrote from Nancy Bertzel. 10 to 50, we call the middle class, and those above 50, the rich. So, uh, you know, you can see that uh, in all these countries, well, in Brazil, the net payers start among the moderate poor, but in all the others, the uh, vulnerable groups are already, on average, net payers to the FISC. By net payers, I mean, you know, you take people at, you know, where they have market income, and then you look at the same individual, what happens when you add the taxes that the individual pays and receives the transfers in cash. I'm not monetizing services here. That's a different story. By that, you can see that the fiscal space, also from the social point of view, is not very big. It's actually very small because you're going to start worsening the condition of people who are barely above being poor or maybe even those that are poor now. So with this I end, and uh, thank you very much again. And I look forward to okay, Thank you very much, Nora. So fiscal space isn't the only thing shrinking. Uh, temporal space <laughs> for uh, question and answer has also shrunk. 
So I think what we should do is all of the, this was a framing panel, and all these issues are going to come up again and again. So I don't think we're going to be able to do a Q&A now, since we're running 30 minutes out behind, and we have a coffee break, and I can chew it that people are ready for coffee. <laughs> so please join me in thanking the panel. We'll take 10 minutes for coffee and reconvene for the first